Welcome, everyone. This is the webinar, Bites and Stings, Avoiding Virginia's Creepiest Animals, and it's presented by the Blue Ridge Poison Center at the University of Virginia Health System. A quick note, at the end of the presentation, you will be guided to a very short survey so we can get your anonymous feedback about today's presentation and also see if you learned anything. And I promise you, it is very short, like six questions. The last page of that survey will provide you with a link to a certificate of participation that you can either print or save. So stay tuned for that. Before I launch into Bites and Stings, what exactly is the Poison Center? Well, it's a place that you can call 24 hours a day, any single day of the year, and talk to a nurse or a doctor who is specially trained to treat all kinds of poisonings. And you don't have to be having an emergency. We are happy to answer any kind of poisoning-related questions. Calls are completely free and completely confidential. If you look at the map there, you'll see there are three different poison centers serving the state of Virginia, and there are actually 55 different poison centers in the whole country. But you don't need to worry about that. We all use the very same toll-free phone number, 1-800-222-1222. So we operate a lot like how 911 operates. No matter where you are, you only have to dial that one number, and it will automatically route your call to the poison center assigned to you. So here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to share with you some facts about venomous animals. And then I'm going to discuss how to prevent a bite or a sting because it's much easier and cheaper to prevent a bite or a sting than it is to treat one. But speaking of that, I'll make sure that we all know what to do if someone is, unfortunately, bitten or stung by something. So let me quick say the, what the difference between venomous and poisonous is because I get asked that a lot. Um, I, I refer to animals as venomous, and people are used to using the word poisonous, and it's very confusing. So something is poisonous if it can harm us if it gets into our body in the wrong way or the wrong amount. As an example, uh, if we breathe in carbon monoxide, if a child swallows a cleaning product, or if someone has an overdose of any kind of medicine, those are all poisonings. Now, an animal is venomous if it has poison in its body, or venom, and it can inject that venom into our body through a specialized body part, like a stinger or a fang. So there are such things as poisonous animals, but we have to eat them in order for the poison to get in our body. There are some frogs that are poisonous, and also there are some fish, the puffer fish in particular, that can hurt us, but only if we eat it. Today, we are only going to be discussing the venomous animals that are native to Virginia and fairly common here. So in other words, critters that you are likely to encounter in your yard or at the park or while hiking or camping in our beautiful Virginia wilderness. But let me just remind you, the nurses who answer the phone at the Poison Center are experts in all animal envenomations. So as an example, we occasionally get a call about a scorpion exposure because some people have scorpions as pets, even though they don't live in Virginia. Well, let's face it, venomous animals are creepy. People are terrified of snakes and spiders, and they are commonly featured in horror movies. They are the stuff of nightmares. Because we have such a fear of these animals, we often have a very irrational, out-of-proportion fear that they're going to harm us. There's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of myths and old wives' tales that simply is not true. So I encourage you to always seek reliable sources when you're trying to get information about any kind of venomous animal, uh, science-based organizations, healthcare professionals, uh, trusted public agencies, and uh, university resources and also the Poison Center. And I do have a, a short list at the end of the presentation of some resources that I really like and that I have relied upon. So let me just give you some perspective here. This chart is showing you the number of deaths attributed to a variety of animals over a nine-year period between 1999 and 2007. And I, I like to show this chart because we are so afraid of being killed by a snake or a spider, but you're way more likely to be killed by a dog than a snake or a spider. Let's look at some data right here in Virginia. So the year 2014, 
there were over 2 million exposures reported to poison centers across the whole country. So not just Virginia, but the whole country. And of those 2 million exposures, slightly more than 55,000 were attributed to a venomous animal of some kind. Now, how many of those 55,000 venom exposures do you think resulted in a death? Well, it's a surprisingly small number, only four in the year 2014 in the whole country. Now, I don't mean to make light of those four deaths. They were all tragedies and most certainly could all have been prevented. But I just want to help you keep some perspective. Um, at that same time period, there were 23 deaths because of an, an exposure to some kind of automotive product like antifreeze. There were 66 deaths as a result of an overdose of an antidepressant. And there were 277 deaths as a result of an overdose of acetaminophen, whose common name is Tylenol. So just keep in mind that things that are living in your uh, garage or your medicine cabinet are potentially more deadly than a snake or a spider. I'm not sure that's terribly uh, comforting or not. At just the Blue Ridge Poison Center, in the year 2014, there were 475 venom exposures and zero deaths. Nevertheless, even though they're rare, the envenomations are serious medical emergencies and they can be really frightening to go through. So when it comes to treatment, the Poison Center is a very reliable source. There are, there are 48 hospitals in our whole region in Virginia and those hospitals frequently use the Poison Center for guidance when they are treating a patient who has been bitten or stung by a venomous animal. So I hope that you will reach out to us and use that same resource for free and confidential advice from the experts if you ever need us. All right, let's move on to the first animal on our list, snakes. And I'm actually going to talk more about snakes than anything else today. All right, I have to come clean. I love snakes. They don't frighten me at all, although I do have a healthy respect for them. All snakes are very important in the ecology um, of our state. Snakes control rodents, which cause far more harm in terms of property damage and diseases that they spread. In Virginia, we have 34 species of snake, but only four are venomous. The rest are completely harmless to people. All four of the venomous snakes in Virginia are in the same family, the pit viper family. And pit vipers have some things in common. First of all, they all have a heat sensing pit. That's what they get their name from. And this is how they detect their prey. They can detect the heat of the, the mouse or the, the bird or the frog that's nearby. And they also have fangs. And this is how they deliver the venom into the body of whatever they bite. And here's a little interesting trivia fact about snake fangs. The snake needs its fangs to survive. It can't, can't live unless it can inject venom into its prey and, and eat it. So if a fang were to break off, a snake could starve to death. And there are an endless supply of new fangs ready to spring into action if a snake does lose one fang. Something else that all pit vipers have in common is the shape of their pupil. So the snake on the left there is a copperhead, and you can see that its pupil is an elliptical shape, or like a narrow slit. The snake on the right is a corn snake, which is harmless to people, and it has a round pupil. And this is true of all snakes in Virginia. The pit vipers have those elliptical pupils, and all the other snake species that are harmless to people have round ones. I also love this picture of the corn snake because it shows you the inside of a non-venomous snake's mouth. So you can see it doesn't have those fangs. It does have teeth. Can you see them? They're very tiny. There's a couple of rows of teeth, but they don't have the fangs. Another feature of pit vipers is the shape of the head. So the snake on the left is a rattlesnake, and you can see that that uh, well-defined flattened spade-shaped head, or some people think of it as a heart shape. And the reason for the shape of the head is the, the, um, the snake's head is where it, it, the side of its head is where it keeps the venom sacs. It has to have enough room for the sacs to fit in its, uh, in its head, and then the venom sacs feed to the fangs. The snake on the right is a non-venomous snake in Virginia, and you can see how it does not have that flattened spade-shaped head. It has a very narrow oval head, and there's very little distinction between the head and the rest of the snake's body.
I also love this picture of the rattlesnake because it's such a good shot of the rattle. All right, let's talk about the four different pit vipers that we have in Virginia. The first one is the copperhead, and the copperhead is the most common, and therefore we get the most bites reported to the poison center about this snake than any of the others. The copperhead gets its name from the coloration of its head. It has a brown, coppery colored head. And here's a little interesting trivia fact about the copperhead. The babies are born with yellow tails. So the last few inches of their tail are bright sulfur yellow. They outgrow that yellow tail as they get older. Here's another interesting fact about copperheads. Sometimes when they feel threatened, they will vibrate the tip of their tail the same way that a rattlesnake will. Of course, the copperhead doesn't have a rattle, but if the snake is lying in a, a pile of dry leaves, it may make a sound like a rattlesnake as the leaves are rustling. All right, this is the timber rattlesnake. There are many species of rattlesnake in the whole country, but this is the one that we have in Virginia. And if you look at the map there, you'll see that this is a snake that prefers the wooded, forested areas of our state and also the very rural parts of our state. It's a large, thick-bodied snake um, with several hardened segments on the tip of its tail that make the rattle. It's a myth, by the way, that the rattlesnake always rattles before it bites. It may not do that at all. You may not ever hear it. We also have in our state the canebrake rattlesnake, and there has been for many years a debate over whether or not this is actually a separate species of rattlesnake or if it's a subspecies of the timber rattlesnake. So at the Poison Center, we have decided to align with what the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries says, which is that it is a separate species. And the, all these maps, by the way, are from the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and they have a fantastic website with lots of pictures and lots of information. So as you can see, the canebrake is only happy way down there in the southeastern tip of our country in the Tidewater area. And lastly, we have the water moccasin, also known as the cottonmouth. Same snake, two different names. And just like the canebrake, the water moccasin is only found in the southeastern uh, tip of our state there in the Tidewater area. The, the name of the snake comes from its wide open white mouth, which it presents when it feels threatened as a means of trying to scare away uh, whatever it thinks is about to harm it. And I don't know about you, but that would work for me. If I came around the corner and saw that wide open mouth, I would turn and go the other way. There is a, uh, a lot of information about these snakes that um, when they are threatened, they give off a musky odor. So you might smell them before you see them. And this is a semi-aquatic snake, meaning that it does swim pretty readily and it does eat fish and other animals that it might find in the water. All right, it's important to have some idea of the, the way that the pit vipers look different from the harmless snakes in our state, but by all means, please exercise caution. We don't advocate getting down on your hands and knees and crawling up to a snake to try to check out the shape of its pupil or trying to encourage a snake to open its mouth so you can see whether it has fangs or not. When in doubt, just assume that the snake might be harmful and leave it alone. But here are three harmless snakes that are often mistaken for pit vipers. In the upper left is a corn snake, and because of its um, beautiful orangish, sometimes pinkish or brownish coloring, it often gets mistaken for the copperhead. Over there on the right, that's a baby rat snake. Now, adult rat snakes are solid black with a little bit of white markings on their face and belly, but the babies have those gray spots. And because of the spots, people often think that they have found a baby rattlesnake. Also, look at the shape of that head. The baby rat snakes are able to flatten out their heads and make them appear like they have the spade-shaped head of a pit viper, when actually they do not. And then at the bottom there, that's a harmless brown water snake swimming in the water. But because it's swimming in the water, people sometimes assume that that snake is a water moccasin or a cottonmouth, but it's not. So what does venom do to the body? Well. Snakes use venom to break down the body tissues of whatever animal they are eating to aid in their digestion. So the venom destroys blood vessels and blood cells and other tissues around the site of the bite. 
uh, that cute little paw there belongs to Frida, and Frida is a West Highland Terrier who belongs to one of our nurses here at the Poison Center. And Frida was bitten by a copperhead snake a couple of years ago, and this is her paw. And um, Frida, I'm happily happy to report, is doing just fine. She recovered really nicely from her copperhead bite. So when a snake bites a human or a dog, it causes that same uh, decay of tissues and blood vessels and blood cells, and this was going to result in extensive bruising and swelling and pain and perhaps even tissue death at the site of the bite. And that pain and swelling and bruising can be quite severe. Other responses that our bodies have to snake venom include nausea and vomiting, weakness, sweating at the site of the bite, muscle twitching, uh, a drop in blood pressure even. Now that picture on the right, that's a person who was bitten by a pit viper, and you can clearly see the puncture wounds from the fangs, so it, it, we know for a fact that it was a pit viper, um, but this person never developed any symptoms of an envenomation, no bruising, no pain, no swelling. So other than the puncture wounds, that was, that was uh, the extent of the damage from this. And it's estimated that about one in five times when a pit viper bites you, it doesn't release any venom and we call this a dry bite. And it's theorized that the snake, the snake doesn't want to give up any venom if it doesn't have to. The snake would prefer not to ever have to bite to defend itself because it needs venom to survive. Without it, it can't eat. So sometimes a snake might choose to bite you but not release any venom as a sort of a warning, like, hey, back off, buddy, I mean business. So what should you do if you believe you or someone has been bitten by a pit viper? First of all, remember, stay calm. Death from snake bites in Virginia is extremely rare. There hasn't been one in years. The most important goal is to get the victim to a health care facility so they can have access to medical care and antivenom if they need it. Remember that swelling is likely if it's an envenomation, so remove any constrictive items like jewelry or tight clothing that are near the bite. And of course, you can always call the Poison Center, and we'll be happy to give you advice to tell you what to do to help you stay calm. And we can also call ahead to whichever hospital you're about to go to and let them know that you're on the way. So... Here at the Poison Center, our nurses call a lot of the first aid measures that people see in movies John Wayne first aid, and most of it is, is just bunk. Um, so the following measures have not been, t been shown to improve a victim's outcome in a pit viper bite, and in fact, many of them could cause even more harm. So don't do any of these things. Despite what you've seen in the movies, it's not true. Don't cut the wound. Don't use a suction device, and don't try to suck any venom out with your mouth. That's very dangerous. Uh, don't apply a tourniquet. You don't want to cut off the blood supply. That's a bad thing. Don't apply ice. Don't use an electric shock. And don't give the victim any drugs or alcohol to ease the pain. That's going to cause problems later down the road. So please just try to help the person stay calm and get them to a healthcare facility as soon as possible. One more thing I'd like to add. Please don't try to catch or kill or photograph the snake. I'll bet many of you out there have heard that you're supposed to take a picture of the snake or catch it and bring it in to show the doctor so that they know how to treat you. Well, that is a myth. In Virginia, all four of our pit vipers have very similar venom, and therefore the same antivenom is used for all of them. So it doesn't really matter which snake bit you, the treatment is going to be the same. And if you try to get close enough to kill the snake or to take its picture, that is highly likely to result in another bite. So just stay clear of the snake. In order to prevent a snake bite, you have to understand how they happen. There are two main ways. One, is when the snake bite is provoked. So as I mentioned before, if you're poking at it or throwing rocks at it or trying to get close enough to take its picture or to kill it, the snake is pretty fast. You'd be surprised how quickly they can strike. And they do not have to be coiled to strike. That's a myth. But the second way that snake bites happen is you just never saw it coming. Because snakes are very well camouflaged to their environment and to their habitat. and they tend to lie motionless for long, long periods of time, so it's really easy to accidentally get too close. Can you see the snake in this picture? 
dun dun dun. Here's a close up. That's a copperhead looking right at you. How about the snake in this picture? Can you find it? There you go. So as you can see, they're they're very well suited to their habitat. They're very very well camouflaged so that they can hide from their predators and also from their prey. To prevent a snake bite, be alert. If you're in snake habitats, just keep an eye out for them. And look where you put your hands and your feet particularly. If you know you're in snake habitat, especially if you're walking through tall grass or leaf litter or other places where it's hard to see around you very well and the snake could be hidden close by, wear long pants or socks or sturdy shoes to make it more difficult for a snake's fangs to be able to, to bite through into your skin. Take a flashlight with you if you're walking around outside at night. This is a very common scenario. Um, it's 11 o'clock at night and all of a sudden you remember that tomorrow is trash day. So you go running outside in your bare feet or your flip-flops or your slippers to drag the trash can down to the end of the driveway. And uh, particularly during the, the summer months, snakes will come out at night to hunt or to lay on the asphalt or the pavement because it's warm from the sun um, beating down on it during the day. And since it's dark, you may not see it. You could step right on it. And then, I'm going to say it again, the theme of the day, just leave it alone. Don't try to kill it or catch it, and it won't bite you. All right, let's talk about spiders. And uh, I have to admit, spiders kind of give me the creeps. I love snakes, but spiders, not so much. Um, just like snakes, though, most spiders are completely harmless to people, and in fact, they're really important members of our ecology um, in the food chain, they help to keep populations of mosquitoes and other insects under control. So that is the cutest picture of a spider I have ever seen. Uh, <clears throat> it seems to say, please don't squash me, I'm killing mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus. This is a harmless little jumping spider. Um, here's a trivia fact question for you. How many spiders are venomous? Well, the answer is all of them. All of them have venom that they use to kill and eat their food. However, most of them don't have the right kind of mouth parts that are able to pierce human skin. So even though they have venom, they can't really bite us, and they can't deliver enough venom into our bodies to harm us. Just like snakes, spiders don't want to bite you. They need their venom to survive. But they will bite if they feel threatened, such as when they're handled roughly, or if you don't see the spider and you've, you've trapped it and pressed it close to your skin, um, such as if you're carrying firewood and the spider is, is on the, the piece of wood that you're carrying. For most people, spider bites are often no worse than a bee sting. Uh, there might be some localized pain or swelling and maybe some itching. So let's talk about the brown recluse. This is a spider that people are really afraid of. Um, but I'm here to tell you, bites are extremely rare. It's a very shy spider. It doesn't like to bite people. And it doesn't live in Virginia. True to its name, the brown recluse is very reclusive. It hides all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't tend to leave its web and go hunting. Um, the symptoms of a brown recluse bite may range from almost nothing to uh, severe. Initially, there might be a lesion that looks like a bullseye, a whitish center surrounded by red inflamed skin, and ev eventually the venom may cause that, um, that to turn into an ulcer. In other words, there's a little bit of uh, tissue death that occurs at the site of the bite. And the ulcer that results might take as long as several months to completely heal. So there's no antivenom anti -venom for brown recluse spider bites. Um, the only treatment is to just care for the wound the way you would any wound. So keep it clean and try to prevent it from becoming infected. Spider bites are often misdiagnosed. Sometimes the bite is not really a bite, but rather it's another injury that has become infected. It might be a MRSA infection, which can also take months to heal, um, or it could be some other kind of insect. As I mentioned earlier, the brown recluse does not really live in Virginia. It doesn't like our state climate. Um, there are a few isolated pockets where the brown recluse has taken up residence. Usually they got there when they 
uh, are stowaways in the furniture or the packing boxes of somebody who has moved from a part of the country where they are living. Um, but like I said, they're not out in the wild, so it's very hard to find them in Virginia. And there are many people who think they've been bitten by a brown recluse, but really it was actually something else. There are lots of spiders that look like the brown recluse in Virginia, but aren't. The one on the upper left-hand corner is the yellow sack spider. In the upper right is the nursery web spider. And over on the left at the bottom is the wolf spider. Now, the wolf spider can sometimes bite people. So when you get bitten by a wolf spider, you may get the same kind of reaction as a brown recluse. Um, the, the bullseye uh, injury followed by a, an ulcer of uh, where the skin is dying away. It takes a long time to heal. Um, and again, just like the brown recluse, there's no real antivenom for that. The only treatment is to care for the wound and keep it from becoming any more infected. Okay, unlike the brown recluse spider, the black widow is everywhere. This is a spider native to Virginia and is widespread. It's pretty easy to find one once you know what to look for. So the black widow spider is a shiny black spider. It's not a furry spider. So if you see a furry spider, it's not the black widow. Only the females can bite. The males are much smaller and they don't really look like that. The males are brown and tiny and they don't have big enough mouth parts to, to bite us. So the female is the only one that's of harm to us. They have that bright red hourglass mark on their abdomen and sometimes that hourglass is a little bit orangish rather than red and sometimes it looks more like two dots. But most of them look just like that. They spin a very messy web. They don't have the, the pretty uh, concentric circles of a Charlotte's Web type of spider web that you might see, um, say, in a garden spider. Their, met, their webs are all tangled up and messy. And they prefer dark, undisturbed, moist places. They also love wood piles, so be careful when you're carrying wood. Now, the black widow spider has a completely different kind of venom from the brown recluse and the wolf spider and most of those other spiders. The black widow spider venom is a neurotoxin, and that means it affects your nervous system, not your flesh. So you don't get that nasty open ulcer. Instead, you have uh, the symptoms are headache, nausea and vomiting, anxiety, uh, sweating at the site of the bite. Sometimes there can be chest pain and difficulty breathing. But the most severe symptom of the black widow spider is severe muscle cramping that's very, very painful, um, especially in the legs or the abdomen or the back. So have you ever had a toe cramp? You know how much that hurts when your toe sort of locks into position there and the muscle is really rigid? Imagine that in your entire abdomen or your entire back for two days straight. You can imagine how painful that would be. To prevent a black widow spider bite, or any kind of spider bite for that matter, remember, spiders rarely leave their web and they don't want to bite you. They'll only bite if they feel threatened. If you're carrying wood or working outdoors, wear gloves and long sleeves. And look first before you put your hands somewhere like the crevice of a rock or um, around the corner up in the shelf in the dark horse barn. Don't poke or taunt the spider or its web or egg sac. And if you leave any gloves or shoes outside overnight, give them a good shake in the morning before you put, put any body part inside them. And then to keep spiders out of your house, seal off entry points into your home. If you suspect someone has been bitten by a spider, first of all, remember, stay calm. Most bites are not serious. They are completely treatable. Clean the area, and you may get some relief from the pain with ice and over-the-counter pain reliever. If a wound develops, like those, the, the ulcer, keep it clean. Uh, remember, it may take some time to heal. If you have more serious symptoms or if you're experiencing any of those uh, neurological symptoms from the black widow spider bite, the painful muscle cramping and the, the nausea and the vomiting, see a doctor right away. And if you're not sure what to do, feel free to call us at the Poison Center and we'll st help, you, uh, help you know what to do next. So... Believe it or not, there are some caterpillars who can sting us. Not many. Most caterpillars are completely harmless to people. Not so much for your tomato plants or your trees, but to people they're pretty harmless. But there are a few who have hollow, venom-filled hairs on their bodies. Uh, 
And when something brushes against these hairs, the tips of them break off and the venom is released through your skin. And even the dead ones can sting you. Most people react to a caterpillar sting with very mild symptoms similar to a bee sting. You may experience some redness, some swelling, some pain, or some itching. When, this, uh, when you have the, an encounter with a caterpillar, sometimes the little hairs that broke off are still clinging to your skin, and you need to get those off because at least for a while they will continue to irritate your skin and release venom into you. So the, they're very small. They're hard to see. What we recommend is to take something sticky like tape and lay a piece of tape across your skin and then peel it off. And then do that again over and over and over again, but be sure to use a fresh piece of tape each time until you're, you're pretty confident that you've gotten the area pretty well. Um, some ice packs or some topical steroid creams or over-the-counter pain relief or antihistamines might provide some relief, but most people are going to be just fine. Just give it a give it a while, and you'll you'll feel better soon. To prevent a caterpillar sting, look carefully before sitting on the ground or leaning against a tree if you know that there's a caterpillar infestation nearby. All right, let's talk about bees. There are two types. The wasps and yellow jackets and hornets all have a smooth stinger, and they can sting multiple times. Over and over and over again, they can stab you with their stinger and inject, inject venom into you every time. Honeybees, however, have a barbed stinger, and they can only sting you once. Once they've stung you, the stinger pulls out of their body and remains in yours, and this kills the honeybee. Now, if that does happen, you're going to need to remove that stinger, but don't squeeze it and pull it out. Instead, scrape it out so you don't squeeze more venom through it into your body. So scrape it out with a credit card or a fingernail or um, a, the blunt end of a knife, something like that. Most people tolerate bee stings just fine. There might be some pain, some swelling, some itching, some redness. Uh, most of us out there have been stung before by something, and you treat it with ice or over-the-counter pain medicine, antihistamines, topical steroid creams, those all might provide some relief, but eventually you'll, you'll feel better. It's something that we all do recover from. Um, to prevent a bee sting, remember that bees are attracted to things that smell sweet. So if you're wearing perfume or have used a strongly scented shampoo or soap, they might be flocking to you because you smell like you might be food. Also, if you're drinking anything outside, Bees might be attracted to the sugars in your beverage, and doesn't matter whether it's Kool-Aid or soda or fruit juice or an alcoholic beverage, they might fly to the beverage and then fall in, and then when you go to take a sip, you could get stung in the mouth or in the throat. So if you're drinking any kind of sweet beverage outside, be careful, take, take a good look at it before you take a sip. Now, like I said, most people tolerate a bee sting just fine, and you eventually recover, but some people are allergic, and you can be allergic because you have a high sensitivity to bee venom, or you can become allergic over time, especially if you've been stung multiple times. Now, if you have any of these signs, you break out in hives, you have difficulty breathing, your tongue or your throat begins to swell or itch, if you have trouble swallowing, or you experience nausea or vomiting, call 911 right away because a, an allergic reaction to a bee sting could be a life-threatening situation. All right, let's talk about jellyfish. So there are many different species of jellyfish off the coast of Virginia, including the ones I've got here. This is the sea nettle, the moon jelly, and the Portuguese man-of-war. The Portuguese man of war is a little bit more rare, but it, it, does, it does occasionally inhabit the waters off coastal Virginia. Now, there are other jellyfish in the world that have really serious venom, the kind that if you were stung, you could potentially die within a matter of minutes. Happily, those jellyfish don't live anywhere near us. <laughs> They're over there off the waters of Australia. Some of them are in the Indo-Pacific Indo waters, but not off the coast of Virginia. So a jellyfish sting is uh, similar to a bee sting. It's very unpleasant, but it's tolerable, and it rarely results in very, very serious symptoms. Most common symptoms are stinging, burning pain, itching, and maybe raised welts or a rash. 
So jellyfish tentacles are covered with microscopic venom-filled sacs, and these sacs are triggered to release their venom into the body under physical stimulation. So when something brushes against it, like a fish or your leg when you're swimming in the ocean, and sometimes chemical stimulation can cause the venom to be released as well. When you're stung by a jellyfish, sometimes victims have pieces of the tentacle that, that break off from the animal and cling to your skin. And if that happens, those need to be removed because for at least some time, they will continue to fire poison into your body. So you need to get those off. You can use tweezers or something like a, like a seashell nearby on the beach to scrape them off or handfuls of wet sand. But be careful not to use your fingers because then your fingers will be stung also. If you happen to have some vinegar handy, I mean, who doesn't take a bottle of vinegar to the beach with them, right? Vinegar can denature the poison. So if you pour vinegar on a jellyfish sting, that'll often help relieve some of the pain because it stops the uh, microscopic cells from firing more venom into your body. However, don't use fresh water. So if you happen to have a bottle of fresh water and you use that to pour over the, the sting, that might actually make it worse because fresh water triggers those cells to fire even more venom into you. And don't use ice for the same reason because ice is frozen fresh water. So how many of you saw this episode of Friends? Well, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, Monica is stung by a jellyfish and the guys tell her that they saw something on television and what they saw on television was that if you're stung by a jellyfish you should apply urine in order to make the stinging go away and then of course in this hilarious episode of friends the guys pee on her leg now thanks to this episode millions of people now believe that this is how you treat a jellyfish sting and I'm sorry to tell you that it is not true urine has no effect on a jellyfish sting so you can pee on it if you want to. It's not going to hurt, but it is not going to help. Instead, use cool compresses. Um, Over-the-counter pain relief or an antihistamine might provide help. Um, you might need to see a doctor if you are stung in the face or in the eyes or on the genitals or over a large portion of your body. So the doctor may be able to, to give you some prescription medicine to help with that pain. But otherwise, you can treat it just by getting the tentacles off your skin and using cool compresses, cool compresses um, and, uh, and just allowing time to go by. The last animal I'm going to talk about today is the stingray. I just love these animals. They are related to sharks. They are non-aggressive bottom feeding fish and they often bury themselves in the sand so they can hide from their prey and also their predators. They don't bite. Instead, they might sting here's the stinger, um, if they are threatened. And they'll sting if you step on them. So the, that stinger, by the way, it can be pretty long. They can be as much as 10 centimeters long. And when, when something like you steps down on top of the animal, it arches its back and jabs that stinger into your foot or your leg. So then you have two issues. You have an envenomation, and you also have a pretty nasty puncture wound. To prevent a stingray from stinging you, you got to do what they call the stingray shuffle. So it's not the latest dance craze. It's a way that you move when you're walking through the ocean. So you shuffle your feet along the bottom of the ocean floor as opposed to stepping. And that way the fish will be alerted to your, uh, your approach and it'll just swim away from you. Just like all the other animals we've talked about today, the stingray does not want to sting you. It only does that if you step on it and it feels threatened. And frankly, if somebody stepped on me, I would also uh, do anything I could to get them off of me. So just like bees and jellyfish, uh, the venom from a stingray causes painful burning, but it eventually, over time, does resolve. It goes away. It's very rarely life-threatening. Um, just as I said with bees and jellyfish, watch for an allergic reaction. But here's the coolest uh, first aid tip that I can give you for an envenomation. If you're stung by a stingray, immerse the part of your body that was bitten in the hottest water you can stand because at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, the protein-based venom is rendered inactive and uh, it will cause the pain to go away. 
So be careful, don't get the water so hot that you then cause a, a burn to your skin. But as hot as you can stand it, I'm telling you, it is like magic. It's a really, really great first aid tip to know. Occasionally, part of that stinger will break off and remain inside the puncture wound. And that's pretty serious because it could become infected. So if you suspect that there's any part of that stinger left behind in the wound, you should probably go to the doctor so you, you can get that taken care of. And also, the doctor might recommend that if you're stung by a stingray, you should update your tetanus. All right, here are three resources that I have relied upon in the past for great information, and I, I encourage you to visit their websites as well. As a reminder, if you need to talk to a poison center specialist for any reason, whether it's a medical emergency or just a question, call that hotline, 1-800-222-1222, for fast, free, and expert advice. Uh, and we encourage you to program that number into your cell phone. If you have questions about public education and outreach, please call me at the numbers on your screen there. And the very next screen is going to show you a link. And if you click on that link, it'll take you to the very short survey so we can get your feedback about today's presentation and also see if you learned anything. And the last page of that survey will provide you with a link to a certificate of participation that you can print or save if you wish. Thank you very much for your time today. I, I really appreciate it. Stay safe out there.